I feel like, with your permission, yeah, yeah, I feel like we should kind of put this whole interview online for people to look at. Anyway, like, I just think we should put it somewhere. Um, I do want to move on to some Yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, fine. I'm just like completely. I love the director's like. Okay, we, we get this some. This is a comedy show, I know, I'm like, so. Yes. <laughs> I know! <laughs> Anyways, later. What do you think about the way that Me Too has been turned into a verb? As in, he got Me too oh, God. That's so annoying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> people don't understand that when you turn Me Too into a verb, it undermines the people who said Me Too. It also undermines our work because it, it upholds this idea that that being me too means that you gotcha. If you think about who says me too and why, then you'll understand why turning that into a verb is just so disrespectful. And you're just gonna take it and flip it and make it mean something that is mostly about the perpetrator mm -hmm. and not about the survivor. It's another way of co-opting our space to heal. Asking people to have a moment of self-reflection mm -hmm. is always very challenging. Yeah. No one wants to look at their own behavior. No. No one wants to look 20 years back into their own personal history and think, oh, perhaps that wasn't, maybe it wasn't my intention, but that's how it came across. And that's the thing. Because we have sort of a tenuous relationship with consent, also the definitions around consent have changed and have expanded over time. It's not that things are different in the age of Me Too and you know now we gotta be blah, blah, blah. What it is is that when you did it in 1976, it was wrong. We didn't have language to tell you it was wrong then. We didn't have an understanding about consent and we didn't have enough of a movement really that would support people coming forward and saying this is wrong. Now people feel comfortable saying, you know what, now that I'm thinking about it, when you were sliding your hand up my skirt during my interview, that kind of sucked. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. I remembered it forever. I remembered it, it forever. It really bothered me. There's not enough information about what survival is and what mm -hmm. it is to have these experiences and then live in silence and shame with those experiences for years. This is not just about exposing the people, it's about getting it out of your body, saying it out of your mouth. Because once you put it in the world, it means that you don't have to live with it alone anymore. Mm -hmm. That is an important step in the healing process. And so folks are so self-centered, they're like, why are you bringing up all that old stuff? Because it's old to you, but I've lived with it every day of my life since it happened. Centering the conversation around the men who are involved mm. is very bad. It is, and it's counterproductive. These individual bad actors that have been called out, you know, they'll be investigated or they'll lose their job or they'll whatever. But you can arrest Harvey Weinstein, you can arrest R. Kelly, you can fire Matt Lauer, you can do all of that. There is another R. Kelly, Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer being groomed right now. The There's playground with the baby Harvey Weinstein is the worst playground <laughs> in New York. But you know it's true. I do. Putting those men in jail and making them lose their job does not change the systemic problem that we have. So how does that shift? It feels like a pathway has opened yes. to have those conversations. We have to shift the conversation. Instead of playing whack-a-mole and trying to knock down and talk about each one of these individual bad actors, and also instead of thinking that by removing the individual, you remove the problem, mm -hmm. right? I've heard people say, if, if men would just change their behavior, we'd have the end of sexual violence. That's a lie. It's a lie because men aren't the only perpetrators of sexual violence. It's a lie because women are very responsible for upholding sexist, misogynist, patriarchal ideas. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when women experience sexual violence, the first person they encounter is another woman. And a lot of times that other woman is the one who's saying, what were you wearing? Were Were you drinking? Why'd you go to that party? We think about sexual violence in terms of crime and punishment. A person does a thing, they have to be punished this way, and it's done. There's no particular set of things in place, and particularly in our justice system, that will be helpful for every instance of sexual violence, mm -hmm. because most of it doesn't rise to the level of crime. And if you shift from that framework to a harm and harm reduction framework that says, anybody that causes harm should have to be accountable for the harm that they cause. That doesn't mean going to jail, it doesn't mean losing your job, but it does mean you have to be accountable for the kind of harm that you caused another human being. If I punched you in the face right now, mm -hmm. would you work with me again? No. Mm -hmm. But if I said, I have a condition that <laughs> somehow makes me randomly punch people in the face. <laughs> this is a bad example. But you <laughs> Are you gonna punch me in the face? I'm not gonna punch you in the face, okay. I promise. But the point is, if you cause harm to a person, before you would 
engage with that person again, they have to respond to that. Why'd you cause me that harm? So that might not mean I'm blackballed and you'll never be on Samantha B again. Mm -hmm. It means that when I come back on Samantha B, I'm going to say, you know, Samantha and I had a really long conversation and I apologize and I did this work around my violent tendencies or whatever, <laughs> you know. But people want to see that you did the work to change, that you made amends with the person you caused harm to, mm -hmm. and then we can we can move on from there, right? Did you even acknowledge that you caused that harm? That you caused the harm. The Biden uh, example? Yes. Lucy Alvarez never used the words Me Too. She didn't say he was Harvey Weinstein. She didn't say he was a serial abuser. She said, what you did made me uncomfortable and it made me feel powerless. Mm. Those are two ideas that so many women can relate to. Yes. So many instances that we've been in with another man where they made us uncomfortable and because of their position, we felt powerless. Joe Biden is sort of the quintessential good guy. Right. Right? He's the guy who passed the violence against women legislation. He's, I mean, take Anita Hill off the table for a second. He's the guy who, who's out here speaking and helping to end sexual violence on college campuses. He knows what this issue is. He has worked around this issue. He's worked around gender-based violence issues. So he's the guy who's supposed to get it. And so what should have happened in that moment is that she was able to say, hey, this thing you did a few years ago made me uncomfortable and I think you should be aware of it because mm -hmm. you do it all the time. Right. And he should say, I appreciate you bringing this to my attention. I didn't realize the kind of harm I was causing. I didn't recognize that my power and privilege, I was using it in this way. And as a person who wants to be president, it's important that I take stock in this and I reevaluate my behavior and I promise you I'm gonna do that. Right. What, what harm would that cause? Yeah. It doesn't diminish your character. As a matter of fact, it shows you as a moral leader. Mm -hmm. It shows an example of accountability. Right? It's all the things that we want to see in our leaders. Mm -hmm. Some vulnerability, some accountability, some acknowledgement. The opposite of the person whose place you want to take. Right. But we didn't see that. And instead, what he did is what so many men do. They get defensive as opposed to listening. I know you don't want to be lumped in with all of these guys, mm -hmm. but I'm not lumping you in. I'm saying, I had this experience with you. Can you acknowledge that this experience caused me harm? People take a defensive posture. Always. They don't like to be told that a behavior that they think is charming mm -hmm. and avuncular. <laughs> I love that word. Resonates differently with different people. Exactly. And there may very well be women out there who love to have their shoulder rubbed by a stranger. Doubtful. Mm -hmm. But there may be. Maybe. But this is why we have to talk about power and privilege. Yes. As opposed to these individuals. Because what your privilege tells you is that you are entitled to touch who you want to. Mm -hmm. And what your power does is protect you from having to respond to anybody whose boundaries that you, br you break or who you might have caused harm to because why do I have to? I'm so-and-so. Everybody knows what the shoulder rub means. Oh, come on. I mean. And so in this case, you have this 70-something-year-old man who is the vice president of the United States walk up behind you, put his hands on your shoulders, and kiss you in the back of your head. That's creepy by any standard. Mm -hmm. It just is. I wanted to trademark a line of blazers with spiked shoulder pads. <laughs> it's still a good idea. You can get Nicki Minaj to be the, anyway. Yeah.